Isn't it great to be together, face to face, physically, <laughs> so, to worship God? Uh, and it will be much better to see more people, more of our people, and, and new people join us for worship. Uh, so let's praise God with a song uh, to praise his name and honor his name for uh, protecting us and bringing us once again together so that we can love each other and share fellowship. And, and, and also with the people at home as well, that uh, with, with the same spirit and with the same heart, uh, with the same Lord, we can actually worship our God together. Uh, so why don't we uh, stand and, and reflect on the first song. Again, we are not allowed to sing yet, uh, but for those at home, please sing on our behalf. Uh, hopefully in the next month or so, that restriction will be lifted and we'll, we will be able to sing our hearts out. Uh, but until then, let's just reflect on the words as the song comes up. Okay, I want to reflect on uh, our God this morning uh, from Psalm 68. Uh, so th- just to understand the heart of our God uh, and where his heart lies in. Uh, so let me read from Psalm uh, 68. For the director of music of David, a psalm, a song. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went down before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You gave, you gave abundant flat, uh, showers, O God. You refreshed your inheritance. Your people settled in it. And from your bounty, God, you provided for the poor. This is the heart of our God, who he has set his heart on the poor, the needy, and the powerless. He has, set, he has been their uh, source of strength, and he is their source of strength. And, and so let's, uh, it's great for us as we come before our God to honor him and worship him and, and to pray to him for our God has set his heart upon us, the powerless, uh, before, his, before his anger. So let's pray to God. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your for who you are, that you are a God who is powerful, that before you there is no other God, for you alone are God. And so we praise your name and honor you. Thank you so much that your heart is not against the poor, but that your heart is for the poor, for the, for the fatherless, for the widows, for the weak amongst us. We thank you, Lord, that you have not flexed your strength, but you have chosen to protect and love us. So we praise your name and honor you for for displaying your wonderful grace and love, especially through your son, Jesus Christ, that his death on the cross declares and, and, uh, and proves that your heart is truly for the lost, for the weak, and for the fatherless and for the widows. And so we come before you, clinging to you and, and, and taking refuge under your wings. And yet, Lord, we also come before you humbled and contrite, acknowledging that we have sinned in the past week. We come confessing our sins, asking you to forgive us. For Lord, we have done things that we should not have done. We have said things and we have thought things that you have uh, commanded us not to. We have sought to satisfy our sinful desires rather than to glorify your name. So Lord, we pray that you will forgive us for our trespasses but we also come assured that you will forgive us. And what amazing joy it is to, and to have this assurance that you will forgive us 
not because of what we can offer in response or in repayment, but because Jesus has already done it, because Jesus has already paid for our sins on his death on the cross. And so, Lord, we, we glorify you and honor you, and we humbly ask that you forgive us our sins because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so it's time for our announcement. So if you have your roots and branches open, uh, please open to the inside left page of the roots and branches. Um, although we are, uh, many of the restrictions surrounding the COVID lockdown has eased, uh, we are still um, bound to exercise COVID safety. Uh, protocols, so which means that we need to, uh, as long as we're indoors, that we need to stay apart four square meters. So uh, if you can try to spread out as much as you can, uh, that will be good. Uh, there is restrictions on how many can actually sit here in the main hall. Uh, so uh, please observe that. And if you're directed to go to the, the kitchen hall or the real hall, uh, please make your way there as well. We've got uh, another setup there uh, that you can watch uh, and, and, and follow us along in the service in the in the real hall as well. Uh, hopefully this will be eased in December when the restriction is further lifted. So we'll have more space <clears throat> to gather in here as well. Uh, when the service ends, uh, please remember that we have to wipe down as well. So we need to clean up. So uh, there are some tabs there with instructions on uh, what needs to be cleaned. So please take one. And if we all help out, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to get that job done quickly as well. Uh, King's Kids will resume today. Uh, so the kids will be able to go out for King's Kids today. Uh, Grace and Ethan will be taking the kids out for the first lesson. Um, and it will be held in the uh, in the man's veranda or in the church hall if the church hall is empty. So uh, please be mindful of that. Uh, from this week, uh, the Bible study will be running as a hybrid. Tuesday nights will be face-to-face -face here in the church hall. Wednesday nights will continue on as Zoom. Uh, so if we can choose be the one to come to, they'll, they'll be pr pretty much running the same uh, study alongside each other. So if you can come physically and, and share fellowship uh, face-to-face, -face, uh, please come to the Tuesday Bible study. Otherwise, join us on Zoom on Wednesday night. Now, the Open Doors are uh, organizing the International Day of Prayer next week, next Sunday, uh, the 7th of November. And to participate in that day of prayer, uh, we as a church will pray uh, on our prayer night uh, meeting. So our monthly prayer night meeting will resume from next month, next Sunday at 6.30 here in the hall. Uh, and, and, and for our first meeting, we'll actually go through the prayer points uh, that the uh, Open Doors has asked us to pray. So there'll be a bit of a video and a presentation on, on that night as well. So uh, please come and pray. Uh, we will especially pray for the persecuted church, uh, so the global church who are facing persecutions, uh, especially in places like Iran uh, and other places, our Africa and uh, other places as well. Uh, and just a reminder, uh, Ibrahim has um, started a, a prayer meeting before the Sunday services. So if you're keen to pray before the service starts and want to pray for the church um, and for the congregation, uh, please come to church by 8.45 a.m. Uh, the prayer time will actually start from 8.45 to 9.15. Uh, so you can, it'll, it'll be good to see many people uh, spend some time to pray for our church and for our, our family as well. Uh, so that's going to be happening every Sunday before the service starts at 8.45. Apart from that, I have uh, got any more announcements. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? Okay. So if that's the case, then uh, it's time for the kids talk. So if I can get all the kids to come out to the front. Hello, Jonah. <laughs> You're getting faster. How fast can you go? Not fast? Very fast? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just going to use this mic uh, just for the, uh, for the talk. So hang on. Let me try something. Uh, let me try to get something out of my pocket. Right. I've got something here that I can show you. Really, really special. Right? 
something really, really special. <clears throat> if you can wait 30 seconds, I'll show it to you. Can you, wait, can you wait patiently for 30 seconds? That fidgeting just sits very still for 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, oh, you're fidgeting, 30 seconds, come on. 10 more seconds, seven, six, five, four. <laughs> okay. Actually, I promise I'll show it to you next week. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I'll show it to you next week. Can you be patient for about a week? <laughs> you know, sometimes waiting can be very hard, isn't it? You know, waiting for uh, 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 30 seconds is hard enough, but waiting for a whole week, that's hard, isn't it? You know, have, do you know, remember when you have had um, your birthday, right? And your Christmas? Did you have to wait a long time for your presents? Really, really, really long time? Yeah? Did you start counting down the days? No, you didn't count. What about the hours? <laughs> When we have our birthdays and when we have our Christmas uh, celebrations, we look forward to getting our presents, don't we? We are looking forward to it and we wait patiently to get it. And it's the best feeling when we actually wake up in the morning and the presents are there, isn't it? Now, what do you do when you, when you see the presents right in front of you? What would you do? Would you just go, uh, I think I'll just wait. Is that what you did? No? What do you do? Do you run in and start tearing open the, the packaging? Yeah, and ask dad to open up the, um, open up the box so we can get at the toy, all of that. It's great, isn't it? So it's great to finally, when the wait is finally over and we can actually get what we were waiting for. In the same way, God teaches us in the Bible to be patient. God promises that Jesus will return and then we can all go in and have a great party. Uh, to celebrate, you know, the best party ever. Have you been, ever been to a party? Have you ever had a birthday party? So you did go to a party? Yeah, that's right. In parties, you have presents, you have um, something to eat, drink. It's lots of fun, isn't it? You have your friends over and you get lots of um, presents. Yeah. But God promises that we are, going, we are going to have a party that is the best of all, even better than your birthday parties. Can you, can you imagine that? A party that is more, far better than uh, your birthday parties. And, and that's what he promises when Jesus will return. In the meantime, what do we have to do? In the meantime, we have to wait patiently. We have to wait patiently for Jesus to return. And you know how it is hard to wait even 30 seconds? And it's hard to wait a, a week, right? How can we wait patiently for, I don't know how long it is, for years maybe, right? How can, we do, how can we wait patiently? We need to help each other wait patiently. We've got to say, look, he's coming. He's coming. Why don't we pray to God and ask him to help us to be patient? That's what we have to do um, as we wait for Jesus to return. Because when he returns, he'll have a far better thing to give to us than what we can ever have in this life far better than your toys. Imagine that, far better than your clothes, right? You're far better than dinosaurs and trains and dogs. Anything better than that? No? Far better than any food that we can eat. And, and that's what God promises. And we have to be patient in waiting for it. But now, now what, we can do, what we can do now is pray to God that he will give us patience. And why don't we do that now? Why don't we pray to God to give us patience to wait for his great promises to come? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your promises in Jesus, that when he returns, that we will have a party that is far beyond what we can experience in this life. Uh, so Lord, help us to be patient, to wait patiently for the day of the Lord when Jesus returns and we, when we can celebrate with him uh, forever and ever. Uh, and help us, Lord, to be patient in this life, as even as we face many things, uh, we pray that you will send us people around us, surround us with people to help us uh, encourage one another so that we can wait patient, patiently for, for the, your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Okay, so it's time for King's Kids. So if you want to follow Ethan out, I think the um, either it's in the uh, hall or it's in the in the ver uh, veranda outside the man. So if you want to go, get your shoes on and go. <laughs> Okay, now it's time for uh, our congregational prayer. So uh, Ibrahim is going to lead us in a, in a time of prayer, and he will also be reading the Bible afterwards as well. So uh, if I can ask Ibrahim to come up and, and lead us in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so nice to see you guys. Really beautiful to be here after all this long time. <clears throat> Before I pray, I'd like to share a verse from Psalm 34. Uh, actually, in the prayer group earlier, I shared this one. It says, this is uh, Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their, to their prayer, uh, sorry, to their cry, which is really their prayer in a way so the eyes of the lord are on the righteous but the bible somewhere else it says there is no one is righteous All right sometimes the word righteous has got different meaning so the righteous means that here it doesn't mean the perfect but it means the ones who really seeking god and if I go down to uh, verse 18, it explains it a little bit. It said, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and they save those who are crushed in his spirit. Uh, the brokenhearted, the crushed in his spirit, not just the sad or disappointed, but the ones who feel they are sad about their um, sinful nature they they know that they are sinful and they, because of that they humble their heart before god and seek him so these are the the word of god that um once we see god with that attitude he will really listen to our prayers uh, remember that answering prayers always conditional is not just a given, but those who really genuinely see God, he answered their prayers. So with this in mind, let's look at the, uh, the congregation prayer list, uh, the normal list we have here. Uh, particularly, we think of uh, Janet Harvey. She is still at hospital, sick. She is better, and uh, but... Um, She's still there at hospital, not 100% recovered yet. So we need to pray for her. Is there any other requests uh, apart from the ones we have here in the uh, roots and branches? Any other thing you wanted to pray for? No? All right. Let's close our eyes and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, that you listen to our prayers. As we just read, you give attentive ears to those who cry, those who seek you, those who ask you. And we come before you today and put our requests before you, Lord. We think of the sick among us. Lord, we pray for those who suffer physically, emotionally. Lord, we pray for the, um, the ones with feeble knees, weak arms, unable. Lord, we pray for the disappointed. There is so many disappointments in life. So Lord, we pray that you lift up their hearts, encourage them, Stretch your healing hand upon the sick and the injured amongst us. We think particularly of our sister, Janet Harvey. Lord, we, you know that she loves you. She's always amongst us here, worshiping you, praising your name. 
And Lord, we lift her up before you today. Lord, we pray that you make her mindful of you. You make her enjoy your peace despite her physical conditions. Lord, we pray for encouragement and give her, Lord, to just think of you and uh, think of your goodness and your love to her. Lord, we continue to pray for Janet. And Lord, also we bring it before you the different um, groups and activities in our church. We think of the youth group, we think of the Sunday school and the teachers and the leaders. We bring them all before you, Lord. We pray for wisdom, how to lead and how to teach. Lord, we pray for the leaders and the teachers that they really are excited about the role uh, before them. And the thing they are going to teach the kids, the thing is going to share with them, knowing that this is eternal matter. And also it is privilege that we can be um, sharing and conveying the good news of Jesus to others, whether young people or children. We continue to uh, pray for our community that people will be motivated to bring to the church their kids for the Sunday school. Lord, we pray that you quicken the heart of your people and uh, move them, encourage them that they can actually make such a step to walk in the church, attend the church, and also bring their kids for Sunday schools. Lord, we continue to pray for our government that you may grant them wisdom uh, to uh, take decisions, people in high offices, that they can run the country the way uh, uh, it is pleasing to you. We thank you uh, thus far, Lord, for uh, uh, our situation here with the pandemic in Australia. Lord, we thank you for the freedom uh, we're enjoying now. We thank you, Lord, that you um, uh, put limit to, to the pandemic amongst us. Lord, we pray for protection. We pray, Lord, for healing for those who are actually suffering from the sickness. We continue to pray for medical staff, doctors, nurses, and all those people who put their lives really on the line looking after the um, coronavirus um, uh, uh, ill people. Lord, we uh, thank you once again that we can dedicate this time, this this part of the service that we lift up your name and make our requests before you. Once again, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you hear our prayer. And we thank you for your promise that you give attentive ear to the righteous, to those who seek you, Lord. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's go to the Bible reading today, which is taken from the book of Ruth. This is in the Old Testament, just after the book of Judges. And I am reading from chapter 2, the book of Ruth, chapter 2, from verse 1 to verse 13. And then uh, just make sure that I get that right. And then I think from 20 to the rest. Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. And then verses 20 to 23. Now Naomi had a relative on her on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of his standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the, the Moabites, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. 
Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went, she went out and they began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she is the Moabites who came back from, from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean, let me glean and together among the sheaves behind the, the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant, servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why have I found such a favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about you, what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly uh, uh, awarded rewarded maybe you you be richly rewarded by the lord the god of israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge may i continue to find the favor in your eyes my lord she said you have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant though i do not have the standing of one of your servants' girls. Let's go now to verse 20. The Lord bless him. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her, to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth, the, Mo the Moabites said, he even said to me, stay with, me, with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, to her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with, with his girls because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the harvest, the harvest girls of Boaz to glean until the, the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, please keep your Bibles open. Uh, we will be referring back to it often, so it'll be good to have your Bibles out. Let's pray to God as we uh, consider his word from Ruth. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit will be with us this morning, uh, that your spirit will guide us and teach us and illuminate your word to us. 
so that we may understand your will and we may understand your heart uh, for us and for, for this world. Help us to live in accordance to your word uh, that our lives will be directed and shaped by what we learned uh, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now you might be wondering, why do we start from chapter two of Ruth? Why not start from the beginning? And uh, I guess um, the answer I would like to give is that um, we want to focus on the man Boaz uh, before we come back to the woman Ruth. Uh, and the series, this uh, I've titled the name I titled title for this series is "Men Like Boaz and Women Like Ruth." Uh, to see how we men can learn from Boaz in how we are to live our lives, and possibly the women. Uh, from Ruth as well. Although I might take a different um, perspective on Ruth because I am not uh, a woman, so I can't actually have the insight of a woman to give you in terms of who Ruth might be. But in that regard, I have a, a different take I might be able to share with you as we go through that. But regardless, it's um, the book of Ruth is a, is a rich story, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, it's more than a love story. You know, if, we, if you ask what is a classic love story in the Bible? Ruth is probably one of the first books or first story uh, you will bring out. But we all know that it is more than a love story. Right? If you read through Ruth, one name pops up and, it, and stands out the most. And it is not Ruth and it is not Boaz. It is, it is God. It is Yahweh. It is Yahweh who is working behind the scenes, bringing all these things together and is working out his plan. And when you read the book of Ruth, you see how God works in the ordinary, how he actually establishes his will and his plan and brings it about in the life of ordinary human beings. And yet there's so much we can learn from the person of Boaz and Ruth. We get an ample view of what faithfulness looks like, what faithful people in a faithless world looks like through the characters of both Ruth and Boaz. So as we look through the book of Ruth over the next couple of months, let's see how men should live like Boaz. And let's see how women should live like Ruth. And when we read the story, one thing that will strike us is that Boaz is a man that seems too good to be true. You know, he's like that classic uh, movie hero, right? or a romantic movie hero, where he is just perfect. He says all the right things and he does all the right things, right? And, and he is just desirable in that sense. He's just perfect. Because we, we also see that in the story that we are about to unfold, that he doesn't take advantage of desperate people, does he? He actually protects them. He actually guards them. Now, he doesn't actually go out of his way to exploit their weakness, but he actually protects Naomi and protects Ruth from their desperation, from their poverty, and from other dangers as well. And, and we will find out later on that he's a man who will go all the way in redeeming Naomi and Ruth in the end. So that's why I wanted to focus on the character of Ruth and Boaz. But we need to remember that God is the overall uh, main character of the story. But we just want to focus on the people to figure out how we can actually apply or understand uh, the life of faithful, faithful people and apply them to our lives. So as, the, um, as we look at Boaz, we realize that he is an idealized man of the Old Testament. He's a perfect man of the Old Testament. There, doesn't, there isn't a better man in the Old Testament than Boaz, really. Right from his, from his story, he doesn't make any mistakes. Right, he he doesn't sin. He he's, he just seems to be just perfect, the right person at the right time for Ruth. But we can still try to understand what lessons we can learn from him. Even though he seems to be so far away from us, there is much to learn uh, from from Boaz. So to understand how Boaz can be a role model for us today, we really need to first understand the backdrop, the historical background to, to, uh, to Boaz and Ruth, the time that they lived in. Because, you know, really think of, thinking about it, 
When was Boaz and uh, Ruth alive? Maybe 3,000 years before us? Now that's a long time, isn't it? 3,000 is a big gap. And, and society back then is totally different to our modern society. And yet, what, we, what do we find in God? God doesn't change. God is eternal. His character doesn't change. So if that is the case, then the character, the godly character of a faithful man in, in the time 3,000 years ago should still translate to us who should be, run, who should be aiming to be God, um, godly men who follow after a God who does not change. So for this week, let's focus on Boaz and his first meeting with Ruth, which happens to be in Ruth chapter two. This is the first time we are introduced to Boaz. That's why we are starting from chapter two rather than chapter one. And here we see that Boaz, the protection that Boaz offers to Ruth is not because he, Yes, he's a good person, but not because uh, of anything that he could gain, but it really is a reflection of who he is before God. The Boaz acts in this way is not because there's much to be gained, but it is really because he is reflecting the character of God. He helps and protects Ruth, not for his gain, but because he has already put God as his first priority. So the first thing we can understand about Boaz is that he's a man who has set his priority on God. So let's turn to Ruth chapter 2 to see why Boaz protects Ruth above and beyond what was really necessary at that time. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 2, we have first introduced the man Boaz. He hasn't actually come on the scene, but this is kind of an introduction or description of who he is. He was a man from the same clan as Naomi, uh, Naomi's late husband which makes Boaz a close relative to Naomi. And verse two tells us how desperate the situation was for Naomi and Ruth, yeah? Uh, what was uh, Ruth gonna do? He was going to, she was gonna go out to the fields to glean whatever was left over from the harvesters going through the fields. Now, Naomi could have gone to, with her, but because of her elderly age, she couldn't go. So it was all up to Ruth to go and uh, glean or pick up enough grain for them to eat and survive. That really shows you the desperation, doesn't it? She's not going to work in the fields to earn money. She's just going along to pick up whatever is left over from the harvesters behind them. How much do you think you can pick up as you go along? Not much, right? It's not much. It'll be like picking, uh, trying to fight, figure out uh, <laughs> That's right. It, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy. You, you, need, you need toothpicks to actually pick out uh, the, the grain as, as you go along. So it, it shows the desperation of their time. But you have to also have to remember that this ability to glean after the harvesters was a provision that God had given to Israel in his law. It, it was given, it was made in the law because it was a way to pay or uh, to support the poor of the society. The poor were able to, were by law, uh, were allowed to glean after the harvesters, to pick up whatever falls to the ground. And, and so to balance out what is happening here, that Ruth is gleaning after the harvesters is a provision that she is uh, exercising because the law allows that for the poor. And so you can actually um, link the idea together and say Ruth and Naomi were pretty poor. They were stricken in their poverty. They had no other means of support. But in contrast, what, what was Boaz like? He was a man of standing, right? Literally the word uh, in Hebrew means mighty warrior or, or, or great wealth, right? So he was either a, it, it, well, he's a, he was a larger than life kind of character, right? He was strong, he was powerful and wealthy. He was up there in the social ladder. So he had nothing uh, to lose. Which places Boaz in a, a, a very high position in the social ladder. And we can understand why that is the case in verse three. In verse three, we are told that he, the field that Ruth actually goes out to work in is uh, belongs to Boaz, 
Boaz is the landowner of the field. So in contrast to Naomi's fortunes, we see Boaz is a man of uh, wealth who is well established, but that is not where the strength of his character comes from. He isn't protective or he isn't assertive and generous because he's wealthy. I mean, we see plenty of times in modern society that wealthy people may not be the most generous, right? We, we see many times that um, the well-off people are not the most generous. So where does the, the strength of character come from? When Boaz comes on the scene, what is the first word that comes out of his mouth? The first thing that he says to his workers is, the Lord be with you. And his workers reply to Boaz with, the Lord bless you. Now, if it's an exchange uh, that doesn't seem to be forced, is it? It just seems like it's just a normal thing that they do. It just, he rides in and says, the Lord be with you. And, and the people reply, the Lord bless you. It, it seems like a habitual uh, kind of a, a common thing. That, that is shared between Boaz and his, and his workers. And in this, we can see the priority of Boaz in his life. You know, in a, a backdrop of a time where people did not care much for God, they constantly rebelled against God, right? In, in a time where people <coughs> forgot about God, Boaz has God's name firmly on his lips. He, he speaks to his people uh, with the name of the Lord. And that's where his priority is. When it comes to his workers, he doesn't ask first, how's it going? How's my harvest going? You know, have you done enough? Is there any trouble? Is there any problems that I need to know? He doesn't ask that, does he? He comes to them and blesses them in the name of the Lord. And in this, we see that Boaz is a man of God. And this is highlighted even more in verse 12. If you look at verse 12, it says, may the Lord, uh, Boaz actually says to Ruth, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You know, in verse 10, Ruth goes to Boaz and says, you know, who am I or who are you that you will be so mindful of me? A foreigner, how can you be so generous and kind to a foreigner like me? And what does Boaz say? He doesn't say, oh, it's, I, I'm not being generous. He, he, he doesn't reflect on himself to say he's the one being generous. But what does he say? He says, it is God who is being generous towards you. It is God who is richly rewarding you for you who you are and what you have done. So what is Boaz actually saying? He, it is not him. It is God. So from the first encounter, Boaz is no ordinary man. He's a man of God who is not only blessed by God, but also God's blessing to others, which is why he doesn't use his position, wealth, and power to take advantage of others. Rather, we see Boaz bless others with his words and possession. Not only that, but he's not ignorant of those who are weak and in need. You know, plenty of people today, especially in, the, uh, in Australia, I guess, and in, in, in the Western world, not many of us actually take notice of the weak and the poor and the needy, do we? Our eyes become ignorant of, of such people. Our, our perspective on the poor are, are, uh, are not the best, is it? Sometimes we, we think, you know, now, we can be ignorant of the situation, but other times we can be judgmental as well. We think, now how can they continue on to be poor? Now why do they persist in poverty? Why can't they actually you know, get out of poverty like me or like us? But you know, if I could take the opportunities that are given to me, why can't they? Right? So we can be very judgmental on those kind of people. Yet that is not how Boaz responds to the needs of the weak and the poor. When he sees Ruth gleaning from his field, he didn't have to speak to her. You know, he's the owner of the field. He could have asked his workers or his managers to go and talk to her. Right? He didn't have to call her to himself. 
And even if, when he found out that she was a daughter-in-law of Naomi, he had no obligation to help further. Even if they were in the same clan, we will find out later on that he is not the closest relative to Naomi and her husband. She, Boaz was um, maybe second or third in line. So it is surprising that when he found out who Ruth was and how des desperate she was, he calls her over. It's amazing to think that this rich man of wealth and of standing would call a foreigner gleaning as, as a poor person uh, from his fields. And he called her not to exploit her in her weakness, but we find that he had already spoken to his workers. He had called her to tell us something that he has already told his workers. He had told his men not to lay a hand on Ruth. He had warned them, stay away from her. He had protected her uh, from harm from within. And he also probably had told uh, the, the women workers to allow Ruth to glean behind them. Right? And we, we'll read, read later on as well that he commands them to, you know, drop a bit more, right? <laughs> drop a bit more, not just the normal droppings, but just a bit more, just push someone off the side, like, like a, a, a TV falling off the back of a truck. Right? So we, we find that's the case later on. This is more than what the law required, really. Right? Boaz was showing more generous and more protection than he was required to do for the poor. All he had to do was allow the poor to come into his fields and glean. That was the extent of the law. But what is he doing? He's doing, going far and above beyond what he was required. He sets boundaries around Ruth so that his, his men wouldn't harass her. He, allows the, uh, the, he commands the women to allow her to glean behind her so that Ruth will be able to glean in the comfort with, of within his field. Why is that the case? Because if she goes out of his field, he can't protect her. Right? If she goes out, then other people might be able to exploit her and attack her. So we see Boaz going beyond what he was tasked by protecting Ruth within his field. And in this, we see Boaz was more than a wealthy landowner. He was a man who not only obeyed God's command to the letter, but more than that, he understood the spirit of the law. For if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, this is what God says in his command. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. This is who God is. And what, is, what does this God do? He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigners are residing among you, giving them food and clothing. What is the heart of God? What can we learn about the heart of God or the character of God? God is the defender of the fatherless and the widow. He provides food and clothing for those who are in need. Does he discard the poor and, and, the, and the helpless and the weak because they're, they're just too much trouble? He is the one who fights for them. He is the one who protects them. The provision for the poor, you know, the gleaning after the harvesters, is put in there as a reflection of who God is. God is a God of kindness, generosity, and, and care. And when God judged Israel for their wrongdoings, what was the one thing that he picked out against them? What was the one thing that he um, placed against them? He didn't judge them simply because they didn't keep the law. But in Isaiah chapter 1, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, this is what God accuses Israel of doing. There he says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. In contrast to wrong, this is what, is what they should have been doing. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. 
In Isaiah chapter 1, God tells Israel he has no use for their sacrifices and festivals. He wasn't after their heartless worship. Rather, he desired to see his people to do justice and good. And this starts from how they seek justice and defend the cause of the weak, the fatherless, the widows, the poor among them. This is the heart of God who desires to uplift the weak and powerless. And who were one of the most powerless at that time? If you had to pick a group of people who were the most powerless at the time, you have to pick the widows. Why? Without a male uh, relative, they had no way of supporting themselves. Unless they sold their bodies, they had no way to support themselves. And in this vacuum of support for Ruth and Naomi, Boaz steps in. Even if he was a close relative, he was a stranger to Ruth. Yet Boaz, understanding the heart of God, protects Ruth and even blesses her. And this is not surprising because ultimately, it is God who is at work through Boaz. This is not how Naomi saw the confidence of Ruth working in Boaz's field. In verse 20, we read, so we're going back to Ruth. In verse 20 of Ruth chapter 2, we read, The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is a close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. You know, just as Boaz, the work, uh, Boaz's workers greeted Boaz with, The Lord bless you. What does Naomi exclaim? She exclaims, the Lord bless him. In response to what Boaz did for Ruth, Naomi can only bless him. Yet he sees more than the work of one man in the generosity of, of Boaz. Naomi recognizes that Ruth meeting Boaz was not by chance. Naomi acknowledges that it is the kindness of God that brought Ruth to the field of Boaz. It is by the plan of God, it is by God's will and his kindness to Naomi that Ruth was able to find Boaz. So while Boaz was a man of standing, a man who knows how to protect the weak, he was also an instrument of God for his good. Yet we also must recognize that Boaz didn't suddenly become this protector of the weak. Right? He didn't just think on one day, I'll just wake up and become a protector. It has been his habitual life. And we see that from his interaction uh, with his workers and that he, the fact that he is a man of standing. So when we know what Boaz is like, it is not surprising how protective he is towards Ruth, is it? When we understand his character and how he understands the heart of God and how his priority is to please God and follow after him, it is not surprising that his heart is for the poor, the weak, the needy. That when he sees Ruth in her uh, weakness, in her poverty, that his heart would go out to her to protect her and care for her. Even though he had no obligation to, he went well beyond what was required of him. He truly was an instrument of God in showing God's kindness to Naomi and Ruth. So when we understand the historical background to the story of Ruth, the character of Boaz stands out all the more. But the story of Ruth uh, and Boaz is set in the time of the judges. Right? It was towards the end of the judges. A time when the people forgot God and did whatever they, they thought was best. Whatever pleased them, they went and did. They ignored God. It was a time that highlighted the faithlessness or the sinfulness of God's people and the faithfulness of God to save his people. And Elimelech is a prime example of the time, isn't he? But if you go back to Ruth chapter one, what did Elimelech do, Naomi's husband do? He took his family, his whole family out of the promised land into Moab. Why? Because there was a famine in the land, right? He didn't wait for the Lord to come and help. He thought, I'll figure this out by myself. And he left the land because he didn't trust in God. But against the backdrop of such sinfulness, Boaz stands out as a shining example, 
almost too good to be true. A man who was desperately, desperately needed in his time. Yet by the end of the book of Ruth, Boaz is sort of um, pushed to the sides, into the background. At the end of the book of Ruth, the, another name becomes more prominent. Not, not, not even Ruth. It is the name of David. Through the story of Ruth, our focus turns towards David. And our hope is that someone better or someone even more worthy than Boaz might come into the picture a better Messiah. Even though Boaz was such a, a good man, a, a, a man uh, who honored God and who knew God and who understood the heart of God, he was no means, by no means the Messiah. Rather, with the naming of David at the end of the book, David becomes the focal point. And yet we also know the story of David, don't we? Was he perfect? Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he was not perfect. And so the story and the focus of the Messiah falls not on David, but on someone further down the line. And our focus shifts towards Jesus. And what do we learn about Jesus in his story? We all, we all know the story of Jesus. We all know how he came into the world to suffer and die for our sake. That's such classic grace, isn't it? That the grace of God is poured out to us through the life and death of Jesus. And yet the gospels also teach us that Jesus had a heart for the poor. He had a heart for the needy. He had a heart for those who are downtrodden, the, the weak, the, 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 uh, the bottom of the barrel of society. Isn't he like Boaz? Why? Because he has the heart of God. Jesus did not seek to exploit the, the people for his own gain. He served them and even protected them. So when we look at Boaz, we can see him as a prototype to Jesus, a man who shows that a, what a sinful world needs. Boaz points to Jesus and teaches us how we too should follow God in our lives. Just as Jesus knew God and knew the heart of God, that should be the foundation of our own life, that we need to know God and we need to know the heart of God. A man called to faith in Jesus, as men called to faith in Jesus, our first priority should be in knowing God. If you don't know God, then how do you know how to live? Well, how do you know what is a good way of living? And if you don't know the heart of God, it's not a matter of just following the rules, is it? You need to know the heart of God to understand how you need to respond to people around you. We need to know who he is, who God is, and what he desires. For if we know that God is for the oppressed, the fatherless, and the widows, if we know that God desires to provide and uphold the weak and the powerless, then how should we behave as men of God? Should we use our strength for our own gain to, to, to you know, expand our kingdom? Is that what we should be doing? Should we use our strength, our, our power to oppress the weak? How should we behave as men of God? We need to go above and beyond what is required of us. If we're able to, we should help people in need. And to help those in need, shouldn't our eyes be open to them first? Shouldn't we be able to see and understand the life situations of the weak, the poor, and the powerless amongst us? Shouldn't we seek opportunities in our families, in our community, and in our church to help those in need? For if we know God, and if we know that God doesn't abandon the weak and the needy, then have you ever considered that you might be an instrument of God to help those in need. That you might be the instrument that God has desired to use to help those who are desperate. So just as our Lord Jesus went willingly to suffer and die on the cross, just as he took pity on us who were powerless to save others, just as Jesus loved us and cared for us, we too should follow the footsteps of Boaz. We too should follow in the footsteps of Jesus. 
For we believe in God who is not aloof from his creation. He is not far away. He is close to us. But rather, we believe in God who, who continues to show kindness to the poor and the needy. And he calls on us to be like Jesus, who sacrificed himself to show kindness and love to us. How can we not do the same for the weak and the vulnerable among us? How can we not show the heart of God to those in need? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word and how it reveals your heart to us. Lord, when we were needy, when we were desperate, you, Lord, set your heart towards us. You, you set your eyes upon us to, to love us and to restore us. Thank you so much for your grace that in our weakness, you displayed your power in rescuing us. So Lord, we pray that as we know the, your heart for the poor and the weak, help us to have the same heart. Open our eyes to the needs of those who in, in need so that we may be your instrument in helping those who need our help. Help us to be generous and protective as Boaz was, that we may display your character amongst everyone that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So in response to what we have heard and um, seen in the Bible, it's good for us to uh, take a moment to slow down and, and to think about our God. And, and let's reflect who God is and what he has done for us uh, through the song we are about to uh, watch uh, and sing at home. Uh, hopefully we'll be singing soon, but uh, let's uh, for, look at the song first. Let's come before God in prayer and uh, give thanks to his many wonderful blessings to our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise uh, for your many blessings in our lives. Thank you so much that you have called us to be your children, that you have blessed us even though we didn't deserve it. So Lord, we come before you thanking you for not only for our salvation, for, for the daily um, things that you give to us, that we may thrive in your blessings and in your grace. And so Lord, in response to your blessings, we come before you uh, to offer this small collection. We pray that this collection will be used for your glory and honor, that you may be glorified through the work of this church, that your church will be faithful in proclaiming your goodness and your kindness, and most of all, your gospel to the community that we are, we are in. We pray that you will use our church as your instrument of grace uh, for, those, for those who are in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's say the grace together to conclude our service. Okay. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.